What's up, world? Welcome to Lead Through Sports Spotlight. We're back with another edition. I'm going to wait for my man, Maurice Carter, to join us. 13-year pro overseas. We're going to get it in. We are about to get it in. What's up, Rock, Britt? How y'all? Let me see if I can request them real quick. Mo. I just sent the request. See if you can um get it. Are oh, you good? Good now. My guy, Mo Card, how you doing, man? I'm well, man. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um, just want to introduce, you know, this is Lead Through Sports Spotlight. Um, these are interviews that I do. Lead Through Sport is a student-athlete development initiative to help student-athletes enhance their leadership skills and to use sport okay. to, to navigate through life. And I'm bringing on people like you oh, to, you know, give that game. You know, everybody thinks they're going pro or they don't have a plan B. And I'm just trying to show people that there's another way. Or if they want to go that route like you did, you, know, you can give them some tips and tools. You feel what I'm saying? Yes, sir. For sure. For sure. Yeah, definitely. So how you doing, man? Everything good? I'm good, man. I'm good. Just enjoying being a part of what you got going on. Um, you know, just being around great people, man, is my is my goal these days. Absolutely. I feel that. I definitely feel that. Are you still um you still team loaded? I am. I'm coaching the sixteen and under team again. Um we got a really good team this year, so I'm excited about it. How y'all looking? How we looking? Good, man. Uh really good players as usual. Again, team loaded, the name speaks for itself. So again, I'm excited about group we have coming in this year that's facts that's facts we had that was a good summer we had 2019 great summer yeah, we had great a good summer. summer had a good summer here yeah, that was fun man. i wish i could do it again but i'm back in hampton it's kind of far to be doing that every day well whenever you get ready man you know you always got a seat open on my bench uh whenever the opportunity presents itself i appreciate that i'm down, i'm gonna be down there soon to do some of these like student athlete development engagements i talked to ty and everybody so i'll be down there soon as soon as possible Nice, nice. Absolutely. So let's get started. Um, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Just you know, a little background. Um, born and raised here in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, I've been married to my beautiful wife Annabelle for eight years. Uh, we have two children who are tearing our household up right now because of COVID. Um, played professional basketball for thirteen years in over ten different countries. I'm a financial services provider here at New York Life. So I hold a license in life insurance, health insurance, and fixed annuities. I uh, played college basketball at Robert Morris University. Um, all one of the all time greats is what they call me there, I guess. <laughs> um, head coach of local AU basketball team are called Team Loaded, and I actually speak Spanish by accident. A lot of people don't know that. About me. <laughs> <laughs> for real, that's real. We're we gonna get more into um, you know, the countries you played that and everything a little later down the line. Um, how many sports did you play growing up? So I was a, I was a two sport guy. Uh, football was actually my first love. I uh, fell in love with football first. You know, and things have changed a lot these days. You really can only play one sport, but Mm -hmm. uh, I think football kind of taught me that contact piece, the the, the uh, competitive spirit, and all all that good stuff. So I was a football and basketball guy. Got you, got you. And what made you choose um, basketball? Why did you ride basketball through college? Um, I just started to get good at it, I guess. Um, played some high school basketball um, here at Highland Springs High School, which is one of the top basketball programs here for a while. And then um, played some high school basketball at the Matthew Catholic High School as well number one basketball team in the country at the time. So I kind of had to choose basketball, I um, <laughs> but I, I'm, you know, I'm happy that I did. I feel that. I feel that. Transitioning into high school, um, what was your mindset like in high school? Because, you know, a lot of these guys in high school now, they're like, they're so focused on, you know, their sport that they don't really see, you know, their life after college and all of that. And, you know, a lot of us don't. But where was your mindset at during your high school stage? Well, I think like any other high school athlete, I wanted to be the best basketball player, football player I could be. So my mindset was just doing the work. I wanted to compete. I wanted to get better every day. And I think that's the mindset you got to have in order to be successful. Now, things have changed a lot since I was a high school basketball player. I'm an old man. Um, but the narrative is the same. You got to put the work in. You got to do the work. So that's just where I was um, mentally. Absolutely. And yet, like you said, a lot of people, a lot of student athletes at that level are focused on their sport. Um, do you think, like, did you were you thinking about life after college at that point? Is that too early? Like, how do you feel about that? 
I mean, you kind of caught up in the moment, especially mm -hmm. right now. You're playing high school. You have a high school basketball team. You're playing AU basketball. Uh, you may have a girlfriend here, your family. So you have a lot of stuff going on as a 15, 16-year-old kid. So you, you, you're narrow-minded, and you should be. Um, mm -hmm. But it's up to you to have – not up to you, but you should have some guidance, a good support group around, around you to help assist you in that stuff after school. Mm -hmm. Did you have any mentors in high school? Like, was, your, was you close to your coach or anybody? Did you have anybody to lean on? So I had a few. Um, you know, Corey Alexander, who was, you know, all-time great at UVA, uh, lottery pick as well. I was fortunate enough to have him uh, growing up, uh, training with him, playing against him. A Co couple of local greats as well. A guy named Fastberry was really good. So I kind of looked up to those guys and kind of leaned on them for, for advice. Facts, fact. How many points you scored in high school? Man, I was yeah, – my freshman year, I was a 15-point scorer. Sophomore year, I was 20. I got to the math, I kind of had to reinvent my game because now you're the top team in the country. So um, I think I was 11, 12 points there. And then my senior season, I played at Eleanor Roosevelt in Greenbelt, Maryland, with uh, Delonte West was one of my high school teammates. I was a 20-point scorer there as well. Got you, got you, got you. So let's transfer, um, go to college. What was your experience like just, you know, being, you know, fresh out of high school, just the experience, not even just basketball, just, you know, Adjusting to the freedom, you know, you got you can do whatever you want, making friends, things of that nature. How did you like? What was that like? It's a lot, man. It's a lot because you kind of don't know what to expect. Um, you show up on campus as an eighteen-year-old kid, you don't have any guidance. Like, you know, you lean on your coaches, your teammates. Absolutely. Um, and so for me, it was kind of like I was like a deer in the headlights. I'm like, man, what you know? What do I do? But I always thought that high major Division One basketball was different than mid major basketball, and it was not. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a huge shock. <laughs> The conditioning, the training, the 6 a.m. practices. Mm -hmm. um, I actually called my dad my freshman year. I'm like, Dad, look, I may want to come home, man. <laughs> He's like, no, nah, you ain't coming home. You got to figure it out. So um, <laughs> it, it was a lot, but I adjusted to it, adapted to it. I got you. So let's dive a little bit deeper into that. What was it like balancing the student-athlete lights? Because, you know, there's a lot of responsibilities, and especially at your level, like playing at a Division One. that's where everybody wants to be. you got to maintain a certain GPA. Like, just speak to, like, a little deeper how you balance that and so, the challenges. I feel like a lot of kids, they want to play Division One basketball. They don't understand what comes with it. You don't have any social life. So when all your, kid, all your friends are partying, you know, going to clubs, drinking, you literally – so I would leave my dorm room at, at 5.30 a.m. I would every get morning. back every morning, especially, well, preseason and all. And then you start traveling during the year, it's even worse, but – 5.30 a.m., 6 a.m. practice, 6 to 8 practice, 9 a.m. freshman seminar. 9 to 11, you got class, you eat lunch, you go back to your second practice at 1. 1 to 3.30, you practice. 5 o'clock, you got another class. 7, 6.30 p.m., you got study hall. 8 p.m., you lifting weights. And this is every day. It's not so, like a big sacrifice. sacrifice it is. You make. It's a, a lot of it, too, is people don't look at college basketball as a business. You look at, you know, Robert Morris University, for an example. This is back 2000, 2002. You know, mm -hmm. College tuition was $42,000 a year there. So you think about it, it's a half a million dollar investment almost they're making in you. You got to put the work in. So you're not out there just hanging out like a normal college student. Facts. It's a business. And that's, that's one thing you used to talk about a lot when we was, you know, going out to eat and breaks between games. Like, these kids got to understand it's a business. Like, once you get to that level, yeah, you got to have fun. But if you're not producing, that's where the pressure comes from. You got to produce. Yeah, it's an know? investment. They're investing in you. They're, a lot of college coaches, well, my college coach definitely told us, if we didn't play well, he didn't eat. And he made it very clear, like, we had a job to do. So, mm -hmm. Because if you, don't, if you don't do your job, head coach going to lose their job. And ain't nobody losing no money behind a kid who can't play or can't listen or whatever the fact is. Very, very true. Very true. Absolutely. So um, talk a little bit about your – um the relationship with your college coach, you don't have to go too far in depth, but I know a lot of kids, cause you know, there's a lot of guys transferring nowadays and don't like to stick it out. And I know that's one thing we talked about a lot is, you know, you got to grind it out. Like you got to be able to take those, you know, hard coaches, the ones that's really on you all the time, because it's going to bring the best out of you. Just speak a little bit about that. If you, you so can. I didn't have a very good relationship with my college coach towards the end of my career. Um, I was one of the all time greats of Robert Morris, um, but he was just a different different outlooks on life, um, mm -hmm. the way I was raised and the way a lot of guys were raised. He's the head coach of St. Bonaventure now. Mm -hmm. Awesome basketball coach, but wasn't my 
just what the players got. Um, but again, me understanding I was there for a reason. Um, it didn't matter whether me and he and I got along or not. I was there to do a job. And the older I got, I started to kind of understand that. Um, but a lot of times you're going to run into that. You know, when I was in college, if you transfer, you had to sit out a year. If you couldn't transfer in, in, in conference, you had to sit out two years. Mm -hmm. So things have changed now with the transfer of portal and all that stuff. So, I mean, today, technically, you don't have to get along with your coach, but you want to. You don't want to have, <laughs> have a bad reputation as a player by any means. Got you. Got you. Got you. That makes sense. Um, what's the biggest, for any student athletes listening right now, what can you tell them? What's the biggest difference between, you know, being a college student athlete and a high school? What are, what's the main adjustment you're going to have to make? So in high school, normally, you're, if you're a Division One player, you're the best player at your school. The best player in the state, best player around your area, probably. One of them. When you get to college, everyone is just like you. Mm -hmm. So then what separates you from everyone else on campus? How do I separate myself to be a starter first, now all-conference player, or all-American, wh whatever your goals are? And so what I would encourage every kid to do is just to work. Put your head down and work. Kill all the outside noise um, because of the advancement of social media and all those things now. It's a lot of outside noise. Kill it. And then, and, then, and then grind. And you'll see the, res the results quickly. Got to make those sacrifices, man. So let's go ahead and transfer to you playing professionally. Um, name the team that you played for in the different countries that you played in. Man, I played in so many. It's going to be tough. I, uh, yeah, as many as you can. <laughs> so I started out uh, in Dominican Republic. I played for Los Cañeros, which is which means the sugar cane. Uh -huh. I won a championship there, and that kind of springboarded me to Venezuela. I played for Marinos there, which is one of the top teams. Uh, Mexico, Colombia. Turkey, France. Um, Turkey's considered one of the best leagues in the world outside the NBA. Mm -hmm. So I was blessed, man. I was, I was fortunate enough to – and a lot of it is time and an opportunity. Um, but, again, I was a guy who, you know, every every day I'm in the gym, you know, doing the work. So he was really blessed. It out. Um, what was I going to ask you? And talk to us a little bit about – because, you know, everybody thinks it's all sweet <laughs> playing overseas. They're like, man, I can't make it to the NBA, but, yo – I got an opportunity to play overseas, but they don't realize how hard it is. They kind of think it's a game. <laughs> so just talk to us about, like, you know, the grind that you have to put in, the pressure that you're under as an African-American coming over. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's key, man. It's huge. For me, again, you don't know what to expect. And so I share this with a lot of young kids now. You're in the gym for two or three hours a day, four hours max. For the other 18 hours, you're actually living in that country. I don't think people understand what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So you're experiencing a whole new culture different people, different food, everything. Um, and it's a lot. You know, in Americans, we typically aren't the most liked people in the world. And so when you show up, it's a whole lot that's going on. You know, how do, you, how do you, I, I interact with my teammates? How do I get along with my coaches? Um, but you kind of find your niche. The longer you play, you understand what ticks, what makes people go. Like, all that stuff goes. And so mm -hmm. I think it's up to every player to – you know, the other thing, too, is you don't have a person who's telling you to work out when you come home from playing overseas. You got to be self-motivated. You have to be disciplined. The older I got, I started to put the right things. All that stuff, what I'm eating, drinking, it was huge for me. I wanted to get every uh, competitive edge I could get. Take care of your body. That's very key because a lot of athletes think they could just go do what they want to do and don't realize, like, the reason why you can't perform in the fourth, the reason why you're not ready for practice, that's what you're putting in your body. No question. No, because you look at you look at LeBron James. I think for and everyone, he's the he's the measuring stick, obviously today. Um, tremendous basketball player, but his body is what separates him from being the great. It's eighteen years in, he's still running and jumping like he's a rookie. Ridiculous! Um, it's because he's invested in his body. Mm -hmm. And how did you get the opportunity to play overseas? I mean, I was I was a all, all conference performer at, at Robert Morris. Um, my first year in the D League, I got drafted. Uh, by San Antonio, I believe. And then I went to the Houston Rockets Development League team. Uh, a bunch of stuff went on. I, I wasn't getting a fair shake, I didn't think. Mm -hmm. And so back then, it was it was easy. I was coming from the deal. I'm like, I'm going overseas. And so I just, you know, started working with a guy. I went to an exposure camp in California, I believe. And then that was it. Gosh, you gosh, you sounds good. And you did a lot of traveling overseas too, man. Just like you know, just speak a little bit about how, you know, basketball can really take you different places, no matter if you continue to play for – if you play for a year, five years, ten years, like it just opens you up to, you know, a lot of different opportunities and for you to see a lot of other things. 
Yeah, it did, man. I, you know, people always ask me where did I play. I'm like, man, I probably played in every country <laughs> in, in, in the world. Um, it gave it gave me a chance to experience again different places, different cultures. I played in Africa one year, which is I, I would never imagine going to Africa and Egypt and all those places that, that I always dreamed of going. Mm -hmm. And basketball actually took me there. I always tell the young kid use basketball as a tool. It's not not, not about what you're just doing in the gym. It's how you conduct yourself, who you meet, build business relationships. You know, I still have relationships with teammates, coaches to today. You know, I met you know 13 years ago. So definitely use it for what it is. Relationships. That's one thing. Out of all the interviews I've had, everybody keeps bringing up relationships, and the power of relationships can take you so far. I'm glad you said that again. Absolutely. So um, going on to what you do now in your career, um, you said you work for New York Life. And that's probably, is that the only job you've had other than being a professional athlete? Yeah, man, I was blessed. Um, and again, basketball actually brought me here. Every summer I would come home playing the Richmond Pro-Am. I would play for New York Life. And I'm like, man, or I'll play against them. And a guy named Everett Fox, who's one of my mentors right now, he's responsible for me being here. He told me when I was playing, he said, man, you're going to be a great advisor when you get done playing. And I'm like, man, I'm not doing that. I thought I could play basketball until I was 50 years old. And the closer I got to retiring, you know, he and I started talking. My wife encouraged me to reach out to him. And I realized this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is my niche. Um, you know, teaching people how to build and spread multi-generational wealth is something I would have never imagined myself being a part of. But when I found out how important it is, the impact I can have from this seat, opposed to just being on the basketball court. I'm like, you know what? This is it. Absolutely. Talk about how, you know, the principles that you learn in sports, you know, relates directly to what you do today. I think a lot of athletes sell themselves short. Um, a, lot, a lot of things that we learn and, and we're taught, it translates to corporate America. Absolutely. Um, I'm extremely lucky from transitioning from being a basketball player to this now, um, this being my first and only job. Mm -hmm. You know, corporate America is different. You know, how how do I use my mind now opposed to using my body? But a lot of those, you know, being disciplined, um, getting up early, um, all those things that we, that we do as an athlete, it translates to being, um, for me, a business owner. Absolutely. Um, so talk about, like, you know, the vision that you have for yourself long term, five or ten years from now. Um, would you say, do you think you'll be working in the same field or do you see something bigger for yourself? Or is this this it right here? Because you have a pretty um, good job right now. Yeah, again, it's different levels to it. Um, being a managing partner or a partner here in New York Life is huge. Absolutely. I see myself continuing to grow my business, obviously, but then also just, you know, getting all my certifications, my designations, all those things. But I, I, I definitely want to remain in the financial service industry for sure. Got you. And you're at this point right now, but at what point in time, like during your professional career or during your college career, at what point in time did you, like, you know, start developing or start realizing, like, man, I need to start preparing for when I retire or life after basketball. When did that process, like, register in your head? Because a lot of student athletes don't. They think they can play, like you said, they think they can play till they're 80. Yeah. And they can't, and then they end up getting families, and it's down and that's, 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 that's key, Taj, when your family shows up. So as an athlete, as a pro athlete, you have, have to be selfish because it's about you. You know, I'm eating the right things. I'm sleeping when I want to sleep. When your family shows up, does it make sense for me now to continue to play? And that's what was a big key for me. My daughter's five now, and I'll tell you this story, well, everyone this story. I replaced a player in France. She was about two or three years old, and I was gone for four months. Mm -hmm. When you come in my house through the garage and through the kitchen, you can kind of see the whole house. And when I showed up, I'm like, me, I looked at her, and she looked at me like, you know, kids, they forget really quickly. My wife thought I was going upstairs to put my bags down. I went upstairs. I called my agent. I said, I'm done. Um, because for me, and I think you know this, I could have played for three or four more years. Mm -hmm. But if it didn't make sense for me and my family, I'm not going to. And that's the key, key piece. Can you feed your family? Can you transition to another part of your life? Does it make sense for you to continue to play? A lot of guys today, I feel like, are playing for way less money just to say they're playing, playing professional basketball. And that's not what it's about. Absolutely. It's, it's more than the game. What Brian and all of them say, more than the game. It's much mm -hmm. more. You have much more to give than just the game. Give me three plain black and white lessons that translate directly to business. For anybody that's watching this, give me three 
blank lessons that bless up not blank black and white lessons that you know that you learned in basketball that carried over to your career that can help anybody with their career and life in general well, be, be proactive um you definitely got to get ahead of the game you can't be a procrastinator at all um for me i want to get everything done so that i have a clear mind um second thing is be a man of your word or a woman of your word if i tell you i'm going to do something i'm going to do it because regardless of how much money you make or you have, the business relationships that you form and make are more important than anything else. I told you today I'll be here. Um, I made sure that I'm here today. I mean, it means much more than anything else. And then the, the last thing I would share is just anything you find that you can enjoy. And I, you know, I took it for granted how, how much I love basketball and I was blessed and able to play it and get paid for it. When you're going to work every day and you don't enjoy what you're doing, you're probably going to be less productive than what you would if you actually enjoyed it. Um, you can impact so many people's lives just by having joy in your life, uh, just by being, you know, who wants to be around a person who's not happy? Very true. That's very true. That's very true. Well, man, I appreciate you, man. You basically covered everything. Um, this is going to be real helpful to somebody, definitely. Um, you know, we're going to stay in contact. I want to get um, your wife on here. Cause I know she played over there and, you know, she might have a different perspective and she can talk a little deeper to my um, female student athletes that I have behind me. So definitely want to get her on one of these days, but man, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your insight with your career and everything. Yes, sir. My pleasure, man. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll talk to you later. All right, man. Have a good one. Take it easy. All right, that was my guy, Mo Carter. Appreciate y'all being on. Um, I forgot to ask him his handle and all of that. But, yeah, he's doing real good things at New York Life and everything. Stay locked in with me. You know I'll be on here next Thursday. I got a nice one for y'all next Thursday. Next Thursday is going to be at 8 p.m. Please remember that because I know I usually do them at 7. But um, the young lady that I'm bringing on next week, she will be on at 8 p.m. Remember to follow me at tscotty underscore on Instagram. Same Twitter, T. Scotty underscore. Make sure y'all stay tapped into me. Got a lot more content coming soon. And I'll see y'all next Thursday. Take it easy. Really, I'll probably see y'all tomorrow because, you know, I'll be posting all the time. But y'all take it easy.